Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Strength in the Number show. Really excited to share with you today guest mentor Michael Lengenfelder who shares some really fantastic advice on how to deconstruct a few different areas within finance. One of them is how to move forward in our careers, make those leaps we need to, yet transition successfully between many different operational and leadership hats as Michael served in many different leadership roles, not just as a finance vice president. We then spend a lot of our conversation focused around the importance of storytelling, maybe the benefits of having a more journalistic mindset, particularly in times when there's just so much data and potential insights out there. How do we get the right balance messaging and headlines across out of that? And as part of doing that, we then arrive at together some baby steps finance professionals can take to more effectively engage with this skill let's call it or ability to leverage storytelling to help with better decision making i really enjoyed my time with michael his energy he brought to the conversation we had good fun recording this and if you do want to find out more about michael review some of the timestamp show notes the transcripts links to the resources mentioned and insights from other guest mentors please check out sitnshow.com and we always really appreciate it when you recommend the show to your friends and colleagues we can be found on all the major platforms you can subscribe at itunes stitcher soundcloud youtube spotify and amazon music and as always we really appreciate you investing time with us today so without further ado over to michael and the show Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. I look really forward to sharing you with our audience. But before we get into the nitty gritty, as we call it, would you mind maybe giving them a brief introduction to your career and journey? Sure. It's basically all tied to the software that I'm still working with. I would even say that I'm a little in love with it, if you can say that with software. It's about the FPNA software. I started 16 years back as a consultant. Then went through all the hierarchy levels in consulting. So from consultant, senior team leads, then led the whole consulting department. And when I back then started with the company, it was a small company. We were 25 people. <laughs> and then came the next big step where I took responsibility for a business unit, which was the utilities in the German speaking region responsible for software sales and consulting. Then came an interesting move from very operational positions. I became the uh, VP finance, so responsible for the group of finance. What I back then did not understand was probably that was already the preparation for the next step. And I did that job also for three years, one and a half years before the software was acquired or the company was acquired unit four then handed over the finance department to the new group. Then I took the next step, which had been always with me uh, for a long time, is the development of standard models. So uh, standardized business models that you could easily reuse in the next project. And after the finance role, I then took a role that was really focusing on developing those standard models and also industry models. And now, three months ago, the picture is completed. I took over the product management for FPNA, and next to the models, I'm now also responsible for the platform itself. So you've had a variety of experiences, and I hope before we go into our main conversation, I'd love to pick some of those experiences, Michael Freud. I find like a lot of the people listening into the show, they're sort of like mini consultants within their organizations, or if they're working in practice with clients, they're like uh, expected to be more advisory consultants now. When you made that shift from that consulting uh, career path to leading a business unit, and having that responsibility for sales and, and, and P&L and so on. What did you find was the biggest challenges for you when you made that leap? 
to be honest, I came from a smaller organization yes. and in, in the small organization, you typically don't have such a clear separation. So even in my consulting times, I was heavily involved in selling the software with my expertise from the project. So it was never that clearly separated. I was involved in many different areas. For me, it was a natural transition from the area that I was and still I'm very passionate about this industry. I was super happy to take the next step in order to push this into the market and make it grow. Yeah. I think there's actually really good advice in there, actually, Michael, because if you have that mindset that you're part of a successful operation and selling the business, I think that'll come on to our storytelling conversation later on. <laughs> that I think it's actually a good mindset to bring in because it just makes you a bit more valuable, a bit more adaptable to the environment we're in and opens up that career path if that's something you want to do as well. I truly believe that you need to have your expertise to go deep, but always keep your eyes open what's around you because you never know what next step might come. Yeah. Hey, that's a great advice, Michael. And then I suppose you turned from, if I summarize it, from poacher to gamekeeper when you moved to VP Finance. So how was that transition moving to finance? Interesting, to be honest, because that's what I've done for many years uh, up until then with the customers I was then able to do internally. That was very interesting to really actually apply all that I was preaching, right? Fully integrated <laughs> financial planning with PL balance sheet cash flow, enable also the team leads to see in the system to see what contribution margins we made in PS, which I think is really important. If you can tell somebody who's working operationally, let's say in a consulting business, that they see what value am I creating with all my team members. If you can see that on a monthly report, I think that opens a lot of eyes that they understand better some decisions that need to be taken. So that was really interesting to basically do internally and also find the challenges that you naturally have there, but basically drink my own champagne then in the internal organization. I know, yeah, it's a bit of an interesting one. I think as far as professionals, as finance leaders, we're very good at giving out advice and putting controls and governance where it needs to be done. Sometimes we should probably take some of our own Yep. medicine drink our own kool-aid uh, so that's good <laughs> it's, and i suppose that then just actually helps the holistic view so now that you've moved more towards product management and, and that's another thing in software it used to be sold as licenses up front and now it's moved into the more of this recurring revenue on the drip type yep. model and that's got its pros and cons but i was just talking to a pricing expert recently and he was saying a business hasn't gone to this sort of recurring revenue mindset or as a service mindset then someone else will. They, they should at least try it, otherwise competitors are going to do it. How, how do you find operating in that as a service software space for you? It must be quite exciting, yet challenging as well. Absolutely. And with the current group that I'm working for, this is clearly set as a cloud company, right? No question about it. And to be honest, there are many advantages uh, to it. We see or we saw in some regions of the world a resisting approach mm. or hesitant approach. Central Europe, for example, was very slow to jump on the SaaS or cloud train. But I think the final push came definitely with the pandemic. So this made it very obvious what the advantages are. And I think that's now the final push for the cloud globally, which makes it the de facto standard. Yeah, it is. We were just talking off air about this. It was, that, it was a niche Cantonese saying around crisis. I think it's two words and someone was sharing me. I can't remember the exact word, but it translated as danger and opportunity. Yeah. The recent pandemic crisis presented a lot of challenges, dangers, but also there was opportunity in that. So I suppose in terms of your current work, you know, what's exciting you most about that opportunity? To be honest, to take the next steps, it's super exciting to direct the product in the hopefully right direction. And we have specified a couple of key areas, and one is clearly the storytelling that we want to focus on. So basically take the next step with FP&A software, so with financial planning and analytics software. Yeah, that's one of the key areas that I want to focus on. It's interesting talking to a finance audience who are probably very fact-based what was it? Facts tell, stories sell, I think is the expression nowadays. So what could we be do better around storytelling in your mind? A, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming from the real world, where there is uh, one thing that I 
do a little advertising always, but it's a nonprofit <laughs> organization. So I think that's more than okay. We've been following for quite some time the IBCS, and that's the International Business Communication Standards. It's a nonprofit organization. And what they basically have as their main goal, define the notation rules for finance mm -hmm. reports. The founders are great speakers. So whenever you get, for example, across a, a Dr. Feist speech, take the opportunity. Because he simply explains for so many things, we have standard notations. Think of sheet music, think of architecture, very clear and easy to understand. And he made actually the good example when you Google sheet music, for example, and you look just at the Google pictures, it just all looks very much alike, right? That you can immediately understand. Do the same thing for finance dashboards. You get a <laughs> colorful picture, but you would never be able to say that there is any standardization in it. That's a clear recommendation that I would give. Think about first the notations, a clear setup that you want to apply for your reporting. And once you've done that, of course, you need software. I think for the collaboration, for the massive amounts of data, it's simply necessary to have appropriate software to support you. And then the last step is what I want to really push is the storytelling approach, right? Because what we see is also critically viewed from the product management side. We see a lot of colorful dashboards, et cetera. But if you critically look at them, what's the message? that you get from them. And that's often a question where it gets a lot more silent. There's one rule of thumb that I have. Even if you don't know a report and you look at it, it should tell you a story. If you need to spend five minutes and you still can tell a story about a, a, a visualization, it's simply not good. Yeah. And the thing about the storytelling is basically a whole concept around it, right? That if you think about an executive monthly report, for them, it should not be searching charts, et cetera. It should be like reading a newspaper. When you think of mm -hmm. a, a newspaper headline or a newspaper homepage where you log in, nicely presented for the target audience, easy to understand, a combination of text and visualization. I was just thinking, would, would a good practice then, because like when we developed dashboards, I'm just going back to earlier in my career, we're thinking, oh my God, it looks amazing. I, I did a really great job patting myself on the back. But if it doesn't have that story, if someone like independently looked at it and said, actually, I don't get it, we might, how do you say, take it to heart. But I suppose maybe getting an independent view from someone else is like, what does this mean to you or what can you take from this? It probably is worthwhile at least sense checking with someone is that would you recommend something like that or do you have any other tips to make sure that people are presenting the dashboards the stories in, in a better way absolutely i think this will actually be a role in finance the storytelling and we actually have first customers where you have those i like to call them also the financial journalists what they do is they need to be industry experts or for their area and they will go in and have a look at the data and simplified what is all analysis and finance about. First, what's good? Second, what's bad? And what's the actions that we need to take? And if you think of that, so they look at the good standardized reports. They analyze on different aggregation levels and they find the good, the bad, and then give recommendations. And when you visualize that now, that's what your newspaper is about. You have some visualization, What's the good? What's the bad? And there's always good and bad without exception. And then they give recommendations. And that's what I think a lot of the executive reporting should be about. I'm glad you used that. Is it going to be interesting to see if we see more financial journalists it even just come up as a role or if it forms part of the role? So a journalist said to me once, what was it? If it bleeds, it reads, right? Which is a very negative way of looking at something. But I'm just thinking of some finance leaders in my past that, and like they would absolutely freak out if they saw like a bad message. They hated surprises, bad surprises. So I'm sort of thinking it's nice that you balance it with the good, but to get people's attention, you sometimes have to maybe position the bad. But I like the fact that there's actions and next steps with it. So there's probably a right and a wrong way of doing this, is there? Yes and no. Honestly, from my experience, there's something interesting in all of it, right? In every deviation, yeah, because yeah. if you think about the thought process, you set a budget, a forecast that you wanted to achieve. Yeah. So you made assumptions. Many people made assumptions to come up to the Sometimes. number that you're working towards. And for some reason, 
you achieve it, overachieve it, or underperform. And finding those reasons, where do you have a deviation in your initial assumptions? We will grow in a certain region. Those people will overperform in sales, in performing consulting projects, etc. Obviously, there was something wrong or something is going extremely well. And both things, I think, are super important. If you find out where do we have issues, you need to fix them. If you find out if something is going really well, and that can be small things, right? I'm not always talking about million deviations. If you have a small area where you test something, also in absolute terms, a small deviation can be super interesting. And then dig into it, find out what's going right and make it grow. So even from an opportunity side, looking at a business, and that's what we're all going for. I think this is super interesting to find out where are the little gold nuggets in the picture and make them grow. Yeah, it's just interesting what our audience are going to think because some of our audience are thinking it could be quite challenging and it's not going good. They're probably not making plan and others, they're making it and hopefully probably have time to go find those nuggets. But one thing I think they should all be doing, and we were discussing this as well, is understand the relationship between risk and return. And that's something we probably should always be scanning for is impending uh, that forward looking risk management. What might materialize? What do we need to be doing about it now? Are there any sort of tips you could share with our audience, Michael, on how to effectively do that better? To be honest, I think that's the most natural thing about business and business decisions. There's always risk and return. And I think this should probably be part also of your storytelling of your mm. recommendations, right? Mm. Yeah. Because if Good you point. recommend something for fixing problems, but also there you fix something, but there might be a risk attached to that. So I think having this full view of the good and the bad or the risk and the opportunity also in the story that you're telling, I think that's the essence of what it's all about. Yeah, no, that's a really good point because I think it added some additional foresight to the insight. So let's say the good and the bad is probably the insight piece and then the foresight piece. This is what's going on now and we're keeping an eye as well on what might happen and we need to call this out and it's up to you, business, if you want to do something about it, but here Absolutely. you are. Absolutely. So that's actually really full transparency, it. right? Uh, that's the full transparency when you make a decision that's then well prepared for such a decision that you have all, well, the options, the risks and the opportunities on the table. Yeah, I don't know if you found this yourself, Michael, but sometimes we're very good at spotting what needs to have happened to get to the X, Y, Z. But some of the decision makers are ABC still. They haven't quite got there. Probably maybe not at our strength, probably from our training or whatever, to help people get from ABC to XYZ. But have you seen any people who've been able to do it effectively, like leveraging software or being able to build it up themselves or, or articulate it themselves? Well, I mentioned before, right, there's multiple steps. I think the software decision is an important one to get this support. I think yeah. with the standardization and the notation rules, you don't Very need good, to yeah. reinvent uh, that really there's good organizations that's a good leg up yeah. yeah yeah and honestly this is a big thing right have a look at what they have defined and then do you want to take it over for your organization one-to-one -one, or do you want to make small adjustments to it but if you have great software plus a clear standardized reporting set with notations easy to understand and as a last piece, then the storytelling approach, right? Easy to understand, good reporting. I think if you have achieved that, there's a lot done. So I think if we encapsulate it there is get the speed to insight faster. It's like leverage the technology, leverage what's around you, standard notation, things like that to get to the insight faster allows you to focus more time on the story piece. And putting that together. Construct. And there's a lot that we just made in three bullet points, but with the right <laughs> software set up, you have immediately done a huge speed up, a huge collaboration that you enable. It's collaboration is a key word, yeah. yeah. With many people on the same system, the single source of truth, everybody working on the same data set. I think there's a lot in this pick a good software for this. There's a lot in that told already where you will profit as an organization massively. Great advice, Michael. You've been giving us great advice, but I am curious though, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received? That's a good one. Honestly, stay true to yourself, probably. And one that we touched upon before, I really never had such a target vision of my career. This one thing that I was going after, that's really what I did over all the years. Just really be passionate about what you do at the moment. 
but have your eyes open the next opportunities that come up. But I was never really going after the one position that's out there. And when I look at it, you could say that in my career, it was an up and down or sideways. But looking back, I see a very logical path now and it all makes sense. Yeah, I'd like, when you recounted your experiences as a journey, and, and it is a bit of a journey, like it actually sounded really fascinating, all the different experiences you picked up. And you still have that passion. It comes across like we're on a video link here, but like your yeah. passion comes across. So I think that's great advice for our audience. Be true to yourself, know what you want, but be open to other opportunities that come out, even if you might feel sideways yeah. or up or down. It actually all feeds in and actually will make sense. So that's really great advice. Look, in terms of resources, our audience could go check out. You mentioned IBCS. Are there any sort of other uh, books, documents, white papers our audience can go check out that they might find useful? That's the one I am currently into a lot. No, I would go with this one. That's my clear recommendation for the moment. Yeah, I've skimmed over it myself. I actually think it's a really great concept because we have standards around presentation of financial statements, which is probably very traditional. We're in a new age. We have software that can enable us to get to the insights faster. And if we present them in the same way, I think that makes it easier for other people to collaborate on them yeah. and share uh, challenge insights and, and things like that and make it better, get to the key messages faster, the storytelling faster. So I think, yeah, definitely worth checking out. And it's a concept when you hear about it for the first time, it just feels right. And that's always yeah. for me a good gut feeling indicator. If you hear something that's just it totally makes sense and you actually start questioning that's true why are we not doing yeah, that or, already <laughs> yeah it, it seems so simple oh yeah why don't you do because like if you said music scores they have their standard notation and things have to go in the right places yeah great point i encourage your audience to go check that out and if they wish to continue the conversation michael with you where's the best place to connect with you at linkedin always just reach out i'm active on linkedin and extending the network every day so linkedin is the place to go Awesome. I will put those links into the show notes. And I suppose, look, you've shared fantastic advice about your career journey and as well as some really key tips around storytelling, risk management and being true to ourselves. Is there any other parting thoughts you might have for our audience before we wrap up? Maybe as the final recommendation, coming back to the things that we've talked before, don't take anything for granted. Critically reflect on the reporting also that you have today and ask yourself the simple questions. Am I telling already a story? Is it easy to understand? Is it targeted at the right audience? Because let's be clear, a detailed middle management report with some very operational details is not the same report that you would want for your executive board. So I think critically reflecting on what you have today, question that, and, and maybe also start the change process. That would be my last s summary message. That, that's awesome. That's awesome, Michael. Thanks. So is that thing with that change process, that is the one constant in this ever changing environment is change is still constant. Absolutely. So uh, great way to wrap up the show, Michael. Thank you for being such a great guest mentor and strength in the numbers today. It was great. Thanks for having me. And let's do this again some point in the future. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers.